Welcome to another episode of the Tell Us More Live Experience. It is me, Mo Jack Luhuku, still your host. Surprise. If you're expecting someone else, uh, you are very much uh, going to be surprised and shocked. Uh, it's been a crazy week, man. We've got a lot to talk about this week uh, and a special guest to help us kind of decipher everything that's been happening uh, globally and particular in South Africa. But first up, shout out to all our viewers out there who've been supporting our show and a special men mention rather to the LGBTQTIA community. Shout out to you guys. It's Pride Month. Uh, it's going to be difficult to celebrate, but we're sending you all lots of lots of love. Uh, we hope uh, you have a good one this month um, and we're wishing everybody the best. Hopefully after this co coronavirus, we'll be able to celebrate together as a community uh, and it's going to be a good time. Uh, next up, we're moving along very swiftly, is uh, something that's been happening this week or all over South Africa. There's been a lot of things uh, 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 happening in terms of breakdowns of communication amongst uh, officials and South Africans in particular. Firstly, within education, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, the minister, Angie Mochek, had announced that kids would be going back to school on Monday. But things didn't go uh, quite according to plan when on Sunday night, she did not make an appearance at a presser, a briefing in which they were going to give more information on how this was going to happen, which left a lot of uh, schools and parents in limbo, not knowing exactly what to do. Uh, some private institutions had taken the necessary precautions and steps to make sure that there'd be social distancing at school, while others were struggling with basic issues such as sanitation and running water at school. Almost uh, 3,000 kids, they said, or 3,000 schools, rather, uh, still uh, required some assistance in regard to these issues, which is also bizarre, you know, so that in 2020, we still have so many schools that lack the basic infrastructure needed uh, for teachers to do their job, and secondly, for uh, kids to be able to go to school. Uh, not only that, uh, there was a ruling this week uh, claiming that levels three and four of uh, the lockdown have been unconstitutional, uh, uh, but that uh, the inv invalidity, rather, of that ruling is being suspended for two weeks. In essence, what they're saying is that it, although the lockdown is, uh, uh, has been unconstitutional, level three and four in particular, uh, the various ministers have been given 14 days to come up with new regulations. Uh, so they're going to suspend uh, these invalid regulations. I know it's very confusing. It's very confusing. But that's the point I think uh, we're trying to make today. There's been a lot of confusion over the last two months uh, in terms of what's being said by various officials in South Africa and what uh, the, the, the public uh, is receiving and how they're interpreting that information. So it's all a lot of it's a, a kind of hearsay. We're getting some stuff through official channels. And we wanted to discuss that idea, uh, what, what uh, or what means or in what way can... Uh, people have very clear and succinct political messaging uh, to let the citizens of a country know exactly what's going on, what necessary steps to take. And and what's been even crazier this week is kind of uh, the lack of transparency regarding some of these issues. Um, it's also been a difficult week because of uh, protests that have been going on all over the world, in particular the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, of course, a lot of people have been saying, oh, this is happening in the United States. Why are South African citizens making uh, more noise about something that's happening in the States as opposed to what's been happening to individuals within the country? Just to be clear, I think supporting a cause doesn't take away from another one locally or abroad. And the truth is, I think everyone's protesting uh, systematic uh, racism and oppression, local and abroad, and in solidarity with people all over the world that have come together to spread this common message. What was interesting on Tuesday, though, there was a blackout Tuesday uh, the idea is very simple. A lot of people would uh, kind of post these squares and, and, and there would be a halting of any communication or posting that wasn't uh, related to the Black Lives uh, Matter 
uh, movement, but things got twisted. Not everybody read up on the cause and what it was about. So what ended up happening were all these blank squares on Instagram and Twitter that were using the Black Lives Matter hashtag and it was removing important and useful resources for people who were out on the streets marching. And the reason that was interesting in particular was uh, uh, there seems to be a breakdown in the rollout of this kind of uh, 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 campaign or I don't know what you want to call it or, or the dissemination of this information and it created all this confusion which could have been uh, alleviated if there was clear messaging up top. That's why in today's episode, as much as I've been uh, all over the place, <laughs> not quite succinct in what I've been trying to say, we had somebody, we're bringing in somebody who's going to help us out and talk to us. Uh, this uh, lovely gentleman is an ex expert in the field of communications, uh, formerly um, head of communications with the Democratic Alliance and now working independently with these uh, lovely organizations, Stratagem. Uh, we please welcome him onto the show, a special guest to tell us about communication, the wonderful Mabine Seabe. Mabine. Hey, good evening. How are you, sir? I'm very well, and yourself? I'm all right. I know that was a bit all over the place. That's why we brought you in here to help us to help us deliver our message clearly. Uh, first and <laughs> foremost, I wanted to talk to you about uh, briefly about your background. You did work at the Democratic Alliance uh, for a while. Mm -hmm. Head of communications, also um, the spokesperson of uh, 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 the wonderful Musi Maimani. What was that experience like for you? And what was kind of your goal and objective while you were at that organization? Mm. Well, I mean, my background is somewhat all over the place. Um, in part, a university dropout, um, though I still intend on finishing my degree. Um, and I've went into the space of uh, commentary, political commentary, um starting my own blog which was called then trust me i'm not a politician <laughs> and then ewn uh picked up uh, my writing i started getting a regular column with them i did an internship around that time as well with daily maverick sure uh, um i then started up an organization with two other people called youth lab which was and is a think tank that's uh, effectively giving young people a platform who are not going to don't necessarily want to go into the political space, but I have a influence on uh, decision making, especially where it affects young people. And then in 2014, 2014, mm -hmm. yep. yes, 2014, uh, or rather the end of 2013, I started working with uh, Musi Maimane uh, when he was running to be Gauteng Premier candidate. Sure. And then when he moved to Cape Town, I moved to Cape Town with him to be spokesperson. And then, yeah, and then became the head of communications towards the end of my tenure. And I started Stratagem uh, with my good friend, Jessica, beginning of this year. That's amazing. What was it like working at the Democratic Alliance? That must have been an interesting challenge for you. Um, what was that experience uh, like for you? Yeah, I mean, it was it was a great experience. Um, I mean, as you asked, I mean, what were the objectives when you went in this? I think it was mm. to, I mean, Democratic Alliance is painted I mean, as, as, as a white party that has no interest in serving black communities and so on. And I mean, from the outside, I could see and meeting people from the Democratic Alliance uh, sure. could see that there was there was a movement within the organization that wanted to, to change it, to give it broader appeal. I don't think anyone can deny that, I mean, any strong democracy needs a strong opposition party. Sure. And that was it. And I went in there wanting to communicate a different uh, narrative, a different view of what the democratic alliances can change how uh, the party communicated. Um, that's why, I mean, even at the end, that's why I decided that I mean, it was time for me to leave the organization because the new leadership of the party must be able to choose the way they want to communicate and who they want uh, in the senior roles of like head of communication, head of policy and so on. But a fulfilling experience nonetheless, uh, I don't I, I take a lot from it, uh, a lot of uh, the opportunities, a lot of uh, uh, the world, the way I see the world is in part uh, played because I was able to be part of such an organization and travel across the country, see both the good and the bad parts of South Africa. 
I mean, it sounds like a fascinating journey. I do. I, mm -hmm. I'm always curious. Do black people give you stick about working for the DA? Is that a thing that like they just give you a tough time about? Look, I mean, I think less and less. So, I mean, that, that, was, that was my experience. That's why, I mean, mm -hmm. I felt that there's a very different DA that needs to be communicated. Um, you, can't, you can't run an organization in South Africa. You can't lead South Africa without the majority on board. Mm. Um, and I mean, hence why there was growth in the Democratic Alliance, because there was a push to get the majority on board. And also not just to get majority on board as, as voters, but to get majority on board as members of parliament, MPs, and, and, and so on, especially young black people. And I think mean, that's to the DA's credit. Uh, that's an organization that prides itself and has done very well in cultivating uh, very young talent. I mean, at the age of, of 13, when I could lead uh, the, the organization as a head of communication, even the person, my, my predecessor was, was a 30 year old and those young people before that. And even if you look at the benches of parliament, it's, it's a very young crop of, of people. Mm. So, I mean, oh, that yeah. sounds like, uh, I mean, that seems like a progressive move, right? There has to be a shift in yeah. terms of who's making uh, kind of major decisions uh, in the country. Mm -hmm. It can't just be the old guard. What do you think of that idea? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, the ANC likes to talk about uh, generational mix, and that's exactly what we need in a, in, in, in a place like South Africa. And it, I mean, that's hence why, I mean, that's, I mean, before, I mean, I, I went into almost youth advocacy because if you look at the median age of, of Africa, it's around 19 years old. And then you look mm -hmm. at the average age of leaders, which are on the 70s and 80s. It's never going to be a generation like that that's going to uh, advance the interest of, of, of people or society that they, they're not, they're, they're gonna, that they're not, that they're not going to be a part of. Sure. But it's not to say that just by replacing young people or well, old people with young people that you're going to get the desired effect of of seeing young people being at the forefront of opportunity. So it's important to have that generational mix. The same thing, I mean, you can have the, uh, the head of an organization being black, the head of an advertising firm being black, but the yeah. output doesn't necessarily reflect that this is an organization that is progressive, that's fully understanding uh, what black people are thinking, what black people are doing. I mean, I, I think that's a very important idea of kind of having multiple insights to contribute towards <laughs> Uh, uh, different ideas and, and projects. Uh, you did move away from the Democratic Alliance, started your own uh, enterprise. Tell us a little bit about that journey and what that's been like so far. So starting that has been something, I mean, in uh, every, I think anyone who's worked in politics after every election cycle says, yeah, this is my last election because it's probably some of the most, <laughs> it's, it's the most grueling periods uh, of your life to wake up early so you can, hand out pamphlets at taxi ranks and so on in the mm -hmm. middle of winter. And then you go to bed late because you've got to prepare for that next day. So there's very little sleep. You travel a lot. Sometimes you wake up in the morning not knowing uh, uh, which city you're in. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> now, I've so, I mean, experienced that, but under mm, very different circumstances. Mm, mm. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, 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 I mean, actually, forgotten your question. I'll be quite honest. <laughs> You're going on the roller coaster. <laughs> that's, that's what this all is. We just we uh, we're talking about your new venture and kind of what that's been yeah, the like. New venture, the new so, journey. Yeah. yeah. So the new venture was was part of that conversation of saying, yeah, let's start our own thing because I mean, especially seeing um, the private sector more and more. The private sector they're no longer insulated from social media scandals. They're no longer insulated from from the media cycle. So, I mean, we, we saw this, this gap in opportunity and mm. as people who are very passionate about communication as it, as, as it being a craft and the thing about politics, I mean, at least for me, politics at the heart of it is about people and politics allows you to understand society at different levels. You understand South Africa that stays in Sanson and you understand South Africa that stays in Kailicha very broadly. Sure. So we wanted to change the way organizations communicate. So it wasn't just, it wasn't very robotic in the way they communicate. And that often what happens is that when organizations are in crisis, because that's the kind of space that we want to be playing in and specializing in is sure. crisis communication. That often in crisis, what an organization will do is that they'll hand it over to their legal team. And, oh, wow. Like that's the, that's and, how they solve it? That's, that's effectively how you solve it. They solve it. Uh, 
uh, a crisis. And it's also just a very backward way of thinking. If the, or the first spin doctors, spokespersons to politicians were in fact lawyers. Mm. So a lot of organizations operate in that realm. So I mean, what makes sense legally does not necessarily make sense at a human, humanitarian level. And organizations need to be able to balance that. So we're working to help organizations balance that and just be able to get organizations to communicate more regularly and in a way, because it's not just, you're no longer just communicating, for instance, big organizations. Sure. It's not just about communicating to shareholders and the board um, mm-hmm. as as a, a, a member of a certain uh, uh, medical aid, for instance. I want yeah. to know what's happening in the organization. What is the organization going to do for me uh, during COVID-19 and so on? Well, that's the interesting idea that you brought up. How important is it for an organization to, to be seen to be handling mm-hmm. something with empathy? How important is that? Because, for instance, you know, like we've had... Um, the minister saying schools will be open and it very felt it felt very much like uh, she was just putting the fate of parents and their, and their and their children's fate into other people's hands as opposed to taking responsibility for that mm-hmm. that's the thing i mean connection with with people is is very important i mean you can say a lot of things about about president former president jacob Zuma, but the point is that he was able to connect with people in a way that different politicians weren't able to do mm-hmm. because he was that simple man, he was the people's person who was able to connect with people. Uh, when he spoke in Isizulu also, he became more genuine, while mm-hmm. appearing to be more genuine in the way that uh, he communicated with people. So, I mean, there are lessons to be learned from even the worst politicians, because often, I mean, as they say, uh, often uh, con artists and scoundrels are very well spoken. So there's a way of, of, of learning about marketing and communication from con artists, the fact that they are able to get on board because they do appeal to that human uh, element of people. I mean, you know, it's interesting that you, there's this idea that we have to buy into what, uh, you know, organizations want us to do, particularly, let's say now in the, in the midst of a lockdown. How difficult is it for you to have some kind of messaging and, and, and have people, uh, uh, first of all, take it seriously and then, of course, buy into that? How do you kind of communicate those messages to people? Look, I mean, communication in a time of, of COVID is, is crisis communication. It, it differs in your day-to-day communication. That's why I think, I mean, for instance, I mean, not to, to advertise my organization, but yes. the fact that I mean, we've worked in the space of, of, um, of crisis communication, I mean, that's the nature of South African politics, is that we're geared uh, towards what it means to communicate in the crisis, what resources and platforms do you need to communicate in a crisis? Mm. And I mean, you said earlier, speaking about transparency, you need that high level of transparency when you're communicating in a crisis. That's why, I mean, for instance, there are South Africans who are calling for, for instance, what models are governments using? What information is government using uh, sure. to make the decisions that they're making? Because a lot of the regula- regulations are becoming more and more bizarre. Mm. And also your message needs to be clear. It needs to be consistent. And that's what the South African government has struggled with. We have the president on Sunday evening call a family meeting. We listen mm. to him, we clap hands, we're like, wow, Mr. <laughs> president, you've done an amazing thing. And then the ministers who actually have to come up with these regulations and their team kind of obfuscate and they make a mess of that entire message. Sure. And you're like, but the president said this and you said that. So, I mean, that consistency has been, been lacking from government and also the coordination. Um, Government has an agency called uh, GCIS or Government Communications and Information Systems. Sure. And their role is, is to be the mach- communications machinery of, of, uh, of, of government to be able to coordinate that. And they've just recently appointed a permanent uh, director general and that agency has moved back into the presidency, which means that this uh, 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 administration is taking communication yeah. seriously but I think the systems and, and infrastructure are still uh, deeply lacking and it's becoming more and more apparent when a minister cancels a press conference uh, several times or, or changes their message over time. And while cognizant of the fact that during the time of COVID, there are no easy decisions to, make, to be made and they aren't, or, or not every answer is the right answer, but at the very be- least, try to get your communication machinery right. Well, I mean, that's interesting. 
for me, then how important is it to have a clear line of communication? Because I think, mm-hmm. as you've kind of brought up, the issue is that one person's making this statement and then there's a contradictory thing that's popping up from the other side. Is that possible in such large institutions to have one clear line of communication where, where they disseminate information and give it uh, to the people? Um, I mean, in, when I worked with Democratic Alliance, the, it's actually there was a directive communications unit that was, I mean, it, was, it, it existed in different forms, but the mm-hmm. scope had changed. And so effectively, I've given carte blanche to develop a strategy for this department. Sure. And I mean, along the line, I mean, I started to realize that uh, standard operating procedures and workflows are very important. If you understand that when a certain situation happens, who are the people that are going to be responsible for A, B, C, and D? And how is it that we get from point A to point B in, in, the, in the train of, of, of communication? Mm-hmm. And it's also very important, and which a lot of organizations don't do, is that you need to have your communications experts in the decision-making room. They can't just be fed information. They need to understand the nuances that happen and the mood of meetings uh, and and the culture of, of organizations. You can't just be fed, say, the minutes of a meeting and then create a press statement out of that. They so, so, need to... So to interrupt, mm-hmm. but in essence, you're saying you, you want them to be there to, to also give insight while those discussions are happening. So they're not like blindsided mm-hmm. with some statement that they just received. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're not just signing off a statement. And I mean, it's very important as well for key executives in organizations, your CEO, your COO, uh, to be part of the communications process, because at the end of the day, they are the faces and images of your organization. So if you have your communicators in the room, your CEO and so on, uh, on the same page as them, and systems and processes that in- ensure that from the conception of a of a campaign or communication piece uh, to its its distribution, there are certain lines of command that are clear. Then it works out pretty easily. It's an easy process, but a lot of organisations struggle to get it right. I, I can imagine. I think it's it's a it's mm-hmm. a it's a thing that a lot of people have taken for granted over the course of you know their careers. They've never thought of actively using communication as a tool. Um, But it's also an important tool for kind of uh, 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 activist groups and organizations who are trying to bring awareness to certain plights. This week has been interesting in South Africa and the States. We've had a lot of uh, protests in some shape or form regarding police brutality. I wanted to talk to you about the efficacy of protests, the the ability Mm -hmm. to to kind of bring awareness to particular messages. Uh, what do you think of kind of this 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 new way of using social media to to either garner attention towards a cause or to use it to mobilize? What do you think of the power of social media uh, in its current form? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, at the inception of the internet, I mean, people were very wary of the internet as a concept of of connecting people. But I mean, it's the same thing with social media. I mean, it's sure. it's, it's, it's 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 fast becoming part of our lives. It's no longer something that we log on to when we go to work. And I mean, with the, the evolution of the internet and so on, we've gotten into social media and mm. they've become platforms of expression. So social media has become part and parcel of the protest and activism uh, ecosystem. So I mean, anything from, I mean, with the, I mean, you mentioned uh, 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 the Blackout Tuesday, Tuesday blackout uh, where where people were putting up uh, black squares on social media and there's a lot of debate around whether I mean it's it's a, it's an informed or, or impactful way of communicating and being part mm. of the struggle uh, around Black Lives Matter and I think it's 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 yet not every activism takes different forms because not everyone sure. can be uh, on the front lines not everyone uh, can be raising money. But I think anyone who's on the front line of, of, of any movement or any struggle, just knowing that there is support to know that you're seen, to know that you're heard, is, is, a, is a powerful, is a powerful message. And I think even just look, scrolling through social media where you see yeah. only these, these black squares and, and in between these black squares, is, it still is a lot of content around Black Lives Matter, around the evolution of black movements and, and, and so on. I don't think we must we must throw out the way people uh, uh, protest. I think we must try and find ways in which we can incorporate 
um, um, all platforms to ensure that we're able to get uh, the messages out there uh, strongly. But I do understand the criticism around it because often mm. people do social media or social activism as a, as for clout and yes. and just for likes. But still, we mustn't discount it because there are those people who do that. When in fact, this is a very powerful platform that can be used to spread a message. I mean, yeah, you know, I, I think to to I think you're allowed to criticize activism, but you also have to give it credit for what it does create. I think what's mm-hmm. been difficult for a lot of people, and this is what I maybe wanted to ask you personally, for people who who are frustrated by having to explain what a lot of things mean or the impact of various social structures, and maybe like myself who lack patience, how how do they communicate exactly what's going on in the world to try to help people get a greater understanding of where we stand uh, socially and politically in the world? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, just I mean, circling back to. I mean, are there right ways or wrong ways of, mm. of activism? I mean, even with people torching vehicles, people torching buildings and so on, some have berated it, some have said, well, then this is how we're going to express ourselves and it's the only way we're going to to to, to be heard. So, I mean, I, I don't think we can say that, I mean, here's a rubric or here's a checklist on on how we, we communicate and how we, we do activism. Sure. I mean, I recall with, I mean, even with the Fees Must Fall movement, uh, which, I mean, was for all intents and purposes, a revolution that was televised. First revolution, mm-hmm. one of the first revolutions in South Africa to be, to be televised. I mean, for that, I mean, sitting with my parents and watching that, I mean, they said, well, I mean, you guys must find your own way of, of doing things. We did things our way. Maybe sure. things the way we did things may not have worked. And I mean, even if we, bring together different things. I mean, like then, like now, we have social media, which our parents mm-hmm. didn't have social media. So, I mean, I think for as long as people are angry, people don't feel hurt, there are there is going to be destruction. And our hope is that through this destruction and, and turmoil that we can be able to get to a point where we can now sit down at a table and say, as a black person, this is why I'm frustrated. Sure. And for and, and for a white person who who doesn't understand why black people in America, black people in Soweto are burning vehicles and, and, and so on, don't understand, for them to sit and listen rather than to want to criticize. And I think I mean, we, at this point, at this point yeah. where it's, it's no longer just an American scenario of black people being mistreated, it's no longer apartheid South Africa, it's no longer xenophobic, Afro, or rather Afrophobic, South Africa, it's the world that's now sure. standing up and saying, well, it's time we listen to black people. And I've even seen the tone of white people change on social media platforms to mm. saying, I'm going to sit back and listen uh, this time around. My opinion at this point in time doesn't, isn't important. Not that it doesn't matter, but it's not quite important and urgent at this point in time. Let me try and understand, let me empathize with why all of this is happening so we can get a uh, uh, greater uh, understanding because this is not sustainable. Sure. The reality is that this is not the first time it's happening and it's unlikely that it's the last time it happens. But hopefully the next time it happens, it's not as violent because we've been able to get through uh, certain conversations. Same thing in South Africa. South Africa, every other week, there's someone mm. who posted someone something racist on social media or said something racist um uh around the price then which riles up south africans yeah but when are we going to get to a point where we're not just being angry but in fact we're making progress and i think that this is a time where in fact we are making progress sure I, that's interesting i think i think what what you kind of just brought up i'm fascinated by how much of the the communications process is listening how much of that is kind mm-hmm. of taking things in because i think in the world in general, people have a desire to express their opinion and speak out, but how much of that process is 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 taking information in from other people and then using that to create your own messaging? Yeah, um, I, yeah. Listen, so I mean, part of listening is is also solidarity. Mm. So I think even I mean we've seen if you watch CNN, especially in in, in some areas, there are a lot of people, and even with fees must fall here in South Africa. There were a lot of white people who were on the front lines of that. And they didn't do it for fame or glory. They did it to understand. Mm. Because 
there's a very different mood that you get from being actually on the front lines and being in the midst of a protest than what you see on TV. Sure. Yes, you may see the destruction and, and, and the terror and so on, but there's a certain feeling that you get being around people who are having a certain em emotional or reaction uh, to a scenario. And that's what protest is. Protest is an emotional reaction uh, to something very severe and, and dear mm -hmm. to you. And to be in that room, in that space on the streets with people who are going through this in solidarity to them, uh, again, is a form of communication. Sitting down and listening is a form of communication. And even just drawing it back to South Africa, I think part of yeah. our problem, the race problems in South Africa, is that we haven't had the hard conversation around race. Like the dialogue. I mean, you and I went yeah. in the 90s. I don't think there were actual, that, that dialogue did not exist. Mm. And I think that's fertile ground for, 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 for conscientizing people and informing people of, of what has happened. And we need to look at our curriculum. Is curriculum, the curriculum, especially our history curriculum, our life orientation curriculum, uh, giving mm. the desired effect? Because I don't think people quite understand uh, what apartheid was. Sure. Many people think it was this bad thing where black people couldn't stay in Santon, uh, they could only stay in Alex and, and, and so on, or in the Chance sure. guy and whatnot. In fact, when it was, and as, I mean, the, the, I think we're starting to more and more, people are starting, the, 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 the language is becoming more mainstream where people talk about structural racism. Yeah. It's not just about, just because we've elected, we've, this is a black democratically elected president that the systems are going to change. Yeah. I mean, what, what is, what are we been doing about the way policing is being done? I can guarantee you that a lot of the training manuals and the philosophies of South African policing are very much the same as apartheid policing. And we've seen it in ways the lockdown has been enforced, especially in mm. poor black communities. We haven't seen people being frog marched uh, through the streets of Rosebank, but we've sure. seen people uh, in the streets of Alex being frog marched and being doing push ups when they're violating uh, those uh, uh, lockdown regulations. So we need to look at the system as a whole. We can't just say, because I think even, even, as I said, the language is changing and there is progress in the conversation that we have to, sure. that this isn't an anti-white uh, movement. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, so being pro-black pro -black doesn't mean being mm -hmm. anti-white. Equally, the system of apartheid, it wasn't necessarily fighting a, 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 a white people. It was a system that, yes, was perpetuated by, by white people, but we're fighting the system itself. But unfortunately, yes, we've got a, a, a black leader. Yes, we've got a democratic system. But the systems in themselves, the systems that were behind the apartheid, the machinery of apartheid, a lot of that still exists. And until we address that, then sure. it's going to be very difficult to make uh, progress and we'll be continue protesting and we'll be here again in six months. I mean, when you talk about kind of uh, the history of our country not being spoken about actively in schools and in history departments, it feels like an opportunity lost. But what are your hopes for the future in terms of kind of the social changes we can make? And then maybe on a, on a micro scale, what you're doing with your line of work to try to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I, look, I mean, I, our, our generation, and I, I say our generation, perhaps those born between, say, the mid 80s to mm. early 90s. Those Are we millennials? Were, Is that what, we're millennials. Yeah, we're, the, we're millennials. And kind of the, the first generation of, of black kids who were going to, well, at, at a larger scale, going to model C schools and, mm. and, 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 and private schools. I mean, we, we, we were kind of, and also our parents as well, we were kind of told, you go to school, get a good education, don't fight, and then all of mm. that. But now I interact with a different generation of, of, of kids who are actually questioning the way things are done um, mm. um, in their schools. I mean, I, at, I mean, this was a, there was a uh, situation of, of, of racism at my former high school. Yeah. And I mean, just listening to the way that the kids were addressing matters of race, matters of sexuality, uh, was very different to the way we did it. I mean, whilst ours were to be, not necessarily went a timid generation, yeah. but we were first generation kind of testing the waters. But this is a generation that is more in tune with what's happening in society. And, and they're not sitting back and saying, 
that we're just going to accept the status quo. I mean, you, again, coming back to fees must fall. I was a generation that did what many generations complained about. They stopped complaining and actually took to the streets and did something. So I think even just in terms of changing the education system, I think mm -hmm. the learners at the forefront uh, of doing that. And those of us from generations before, we must do as much as we can to support them. And as, as an organization, Stratagem, I mean, we yeah. were folk, I mean, aside from the communication uh, uh, side of things, we've got to focus on corporate social investment. Uh, and it's not just throwing, for instance, during Mandela Day, often an organization will go paint to school and then walk away. We're saying, what can we do for society? What issues can we pick up that are going to be long-term and sustainable uh, for you? example uh, you'll find that i mean a lot of i mean let me look at, at the commerce department yeah. what are the big banks and so on to ensure doing to ensure that we get the right kind of people to be running the economy because essentially now the economy is changing standard bank must be saying fine we need we're going to need so many actuaries uh for the next uh 10 years what are we going to do as, as as a bank to ensure that we do have those skills because whilst there's a uh uh high unemployment in South Africa. Sure. Also as universities and government are they having a conversation and saying, what kind of skills uh, do we need to pump into society? So we want to get those kind of private uh, public partnerships going on at a sustainable level rather than just once off saying painting a school. Let's rather say, let's build a school and ensure that's got the necessary infrastructure that's going to educate learners for the next 10 to 20 years. That sounds dope. You're trying to work on kind of sustainable projects that will work in the future and kind of provide the necessary skills required for future generations. I think that's beautiful. Um, on behalf of myself and everyone who watches, we want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, and hopefully your COVID experience isn't going too bad. But thank you once again for joining us on the show. No, it's been a pleasure. And uh, good luck with the show. I mean, I've, I've watched a couple of episodes. And it's, it's, I actually didn't know what, to, what I was walking into. Because, I mean... <laughs> Because, I mean, it was quite, I mean, like, the episode, I watched the episode of Skumba and I mean, that was very really lighthearted and, sure. and fun. And, I mean, we were here to discuss quite serious things. But I think, yeah, no, it was, it was a nice conversation and looking forward to see who else we have next. We appreciate it. We've got to mix it up. We've got to have some, some serious stuff. We've got to have some light stuff. But we've got to try also educate the people, whoever's watching out there. Hopefully, we give them mm -hmm. more insight into what's going on. Yeah. Ta, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us, sir. Cheers, uh, for you guys who tuned in today to another episode of the Tell Us More Live Experience, uh, please make sure to subscribe and like down below and join us for more episodes. And we'll see you guys soon. Uh, peace out. Hope you're doing okay. Sending love to all of you during these testing times. We'll see you guys soon. Okay, thanks. Bye.